welcome to uh, Spokane TEDx 2020. Um, we are here tonight to audition 11 potential speakers for uh, TEDx Spokane 2020. And um, by just waving at my camera, how many of you guys have been to TEDx Spokane before? Oh, there's one. Uh, two, three, maybe. That's good. That's not too many. So um, anyway, this uh, TEDx Spokane, we will be in our, I think it's our ninth year. Charlie will correct me if I'm wrong, coming up. And we are still planning uh, at this point to have a live event at the Bing on October 10th, live and in person with all of you. And uh, we, uh, well, and I say with all of you, but all of you who are chosen to speak and the rest of you are going to be in the audience. So that's awesome to see. Um, we, uh, we recognize that this year is a very different year than other years. Uh, and so um, we may not be able to hold our event as we are planning right now at the Bing, live at the Bing, or we may. We just, we don't know at this point. Um, the, uh, let you know that the, uh, the TEDx board, uh, the safety of our speakers, volunteers, audience members, and community um, is TEDx's number one priority. And we'll be sure that we put that out in front of any decisions we make about what to do in October. Um, so with that in mind, we are um, a, also working on a plan B. Plan A being that we're live at the Bing as planned. And plan B is that we would be doing a virtual event of some kind. Um, and we don't know exactly what that'll look like now. Um, but when we hear from the Bing, the city, the county, and the state on what we uh, can or should do about October 10th, that's what we're going to do. So summary of all that is that we're planning to be uh, live at the Bing on October 10th, uh, as we've done our other TEDs. And if something comes up and we can't do that, there'll be some form of a virtual event also taking place on October 10th. So that's our, that's our current plan. Um, the theme of the conference at this point is, um, is ideas worth sharing. And um, we, that theme is sort of the general theme for TEDx National. We probably will have a more specific theme once we pick our speaker lineup, which we are in the process of doing. So when we choose our speaker lineup, we may have a slightly different theme. We chose not to put the theme out ahead of time this year because we found that a lot of the folks who were applying were trying to shoehorn their idea into the theme and it just didn't work. So this year, uh, just ideas worth sharing, which all of you have given us a great paper application with an idea worth sharing. Um, who is TEDx Spokane? TEDx Spokane is uh, a group of community volunteers, 100% volunteer run, um, and we're run by a uh, parent organization known as NXT, which stands for Northwest X Talks. It's as close as we could get to have a nonprofit to umbrella for this. Uh, where the IRS could recognize the name. And uh, TEDx also is uh, a board of uh, folks who are running the steering committee, um, one of which is Jamie Tender, who I'm not sure is on yet or not, but he is the current license holder for TEDx uh, Spokane and has been since the beginning. Um, our, uh, a little bit about our audition process, what we're doing tonight. Um, we... Uh, We've had about 160 paper applications for our uh, speaking uh, event, and we're in the process of reviewing those applications now. Um, we have done four previous auditions, and this is the fifth and final of our auditions. So that means we'll be uh, reviewing about 40 or 45 uh, of our paper applications have been able to come and do auditions for us. And from that list of 40 or 45, we'll be choosing about 12 to 14 speakers. Um, that selection process will happen sometime in the first uh, week or week and a half of May. And we'll be letting everybody know uh, either you're in or you're out uh, by that date. So sometimes say uh, uh, late first week, early second week in May is our current plan. Uh, as I said tonight, we're gonna be auditioning uh, 11 folks. Um, we have a schedule that we sent out to you guys, and uh, that schedule reads, we're going to go in this order, that schedule reads uh, Cameron, Janet Mann, Katie, Thomas Cam, Dan, Wolfgang, then we'll have a short break, then uh, Brooke, Michael, Julie, Wade, and Tracy. So uh, that's the order that we're going to go in. Um, we are going to, uh, each of you will be given seven minutes to pitch your big idea with the things that were sent to you in the email about that. 
And then at the end of that seven minutes, there'll be time for a minute or two of questions. Um, Charlie, uh, who you met earlier, he was waving around, he will be keeping time and he's going to wave his fingers around and give you a one minute warning when we are uh, close, when you're close, so that you know. And at seven minutes, your time will be up wherever you happen to be. We try to keep these pretty strict to be fair to everybody else who's, who's mm -hmm. presenting here. Um, then again, we'll have a, a couple of minutes for questions. And those questions will be uh, clarifying questions. There'll be things like, uh, do you expect to have a PowerPoint with your presentation? Or uh, are you going to uh, reference research work uh, in your presentation? Um, what do you think the primary audience for your talk uh, will be? Who do you think the primary audience will be? Those kinds of questions. Uh, they won't be coaching questions. We're not, we're not going to be doing any of those. So it won't be any things like, well, you know, it would be better if you did this instead of that. Or are you aware of this instead of that? Won't be any of that. It's just going to be straight sort of clarifying questions about your um, about your presentation. Um, tonight, we will both be recording the event, as you guys have a little button that tells you that now. Um, that's so that the curation committee can review uh, the audition if we need to when we're uh, trying to make our difficult decisions about who's going to speak. And then um, also, uh, we are going to be live streaming this event for the first time tonight. And uh, Haley is going to tell us a little bit more about the live stream. Haley? Yes, so we're live now. I just hit the button. Um, so just a few kind of etiquette rules from our friends who are on our Zoom call. Um, I'm going to mute everyone. Um, I'm the host of this meeting. So unless you are the presenter, well, um, everybody will be muted. One or two of you had a uh, co-presenter with you. Uh, just make sure that you tell me that. I'll make sure that person is unmuted as well. Um, we'll go live the whole way through. So even with the breaks, um, I'll put up a little kind of screen placeholder thing. Um, that's what people will see when we go on breaks, our friends at Facebook. Um, but yeah, so we'll just be really courteous, obviously, of the fact that we're streaming live to Facebook right now. But um, anything that you're concerned about, shoot me a chat down in the right hand corner. But um, we are live. We're testing this for a few other events in the summer. And so far, so good. Thank you very much, Haley. And um, uh, the, just to let you know in the overall picture of TED, uh, tickets will be going on sale this next week for general admission. We've already had some early bird uh, tickets available and we'll be starting to sell tickets for our event uh, this week. So we're, uh, we're moving right along. Um, Charlie, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Charlie Wolf is a, another member of our curation committee. I was gonna queue up our list of criteria just to clarify again we're looking for a little about yourself a succinct uh, statement about your big idea why you're passionate about your big idea why others should be passionate about your idea and to take away from from your big idea in the talk so just a recap for the six the six minutes or so that we're we're together and then uh, the three minutes and please don't feel defensive if we ask you questions that's not the point it's more about how would you present the information and, and we don't need you to describe it or defend it by any means. We're just saying, would you use a PowerPoint? Would you not? Do you have data? Do you not? It, it's kind of hoping to flesh out what, what we're, uh, how better to, to present it. It's not about the validity of it. That makes sense. Um, sponsors, we're still working on a new version of sponsors right now. I'll be perfectly honest with um, the, the kind of the, shift in format so um, if you want to be involved in TEDx uh, beyond speaking or outside of speaking we'd love your, your support and you can reach out to us afterwards too so that's it looking forward to hearing some more detail on I've read all the applications so I'm excited to hear more details from everybody Great. So uh, with uh, that said, um, let's launch into it. So Cameron, are you ready to go? I sure am ready to go. Okay, one, I'm going to mute everyone, Cameron, and then I will unmute you. No worries. Okay, you should be good. Good to go. Got me? Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, my name is Cameron Chestnut. I uh, live over in Coeur d'Alene. I work in Spokane. And I'm a native to this area. Um, grew, born and raised here. Did most of my education sort of through Washington State, University of Washington, went down to uh, LA for part of it, and 
ended up making the decision to come back to the area. And I only say that because um, as a young professional coming back to the Spokane area, it's a little bit difficult sometimes, I think, because that's uh, not our biggest population density of other young professionals. And I think that events like this actually came to the first TED when I moved back to the area, um, TEDx. And I just think it's a good way to stimulate. So I guess thanks from everybody for even having us involved, but it's a really cool event to have. So I'm honored to you know be interviewing for it. And, um, you know, I am a dad and a husband and I have three little kids, ages six, four and two boys and girls. Um, I'm a facial plastic surgeon and derm surgeon. So I do like a lot of skin cancer reconstructions on the face um, after removal of those tumors. I do some cosmetic work and then I do some health optimization, which is like a primary care based model using some modalities like hyperbaric oxygen and um, like con I'm sitting in a sauna right now, like sauna and cold exposure, contrast, LED lights, things like that to basically just improve health span and mostly uh, lifespan of our patients a little bit. So, um, you know, that's, uh, to me, that that's my big idea is this sort of, I've always had this dichotomy in my life of, or I've had this sort of personal mission to be a bit of a, you know, a superhuman and take good care of myself and kind of be the best I can be. And um, you know, when I first started out my career before I had kids, it was doing the same thing with my patients, trying to sort of create, be a superhuman and create superhumans on the other side. Um, and then with my kids, once I have them, then it really comes into play. And that's like, you're trying to raise little superhumans there. And so I've always had this sort of like theme running through, but there was always this dichotomous part of my life where, you know, I'd come home from work and I'd be, you know, writing a paper or doing something. And, you know, my kids would see these pictures of me sort of fixing alleys they'd call it like defects on somebody's face like a hole and then a fix afterwards and so for my kids it's always been oh daddy fixes alleys at work and you know that's partially true and I just kind of left all the other things out of it and it's always been sort of this interesting dichotomy that like that's my life at home this is my life at work my kids think I do this and, and I go about it but um, I found myself doing that a lot with my uh, just personal endeavors too you know like I'd be waking up early and working out or doing ice baths or breath work or um, you know fasting or whatever and just not letting my kids know about it because I didn't want to be the weird dad who did those things and I wanted to keep it separate and so another dichotomous part of this life and um, same thing when I was applying that to my patients you know I didn't when I first started practice I didn't really do any of these sort of wellness based things with my uh, surgeries or my outcomes it was just sort of that was for me and that was the other part of my life and so I went through this interesting thought exercise of sort of like okay I have this dichotomous thing I've written this narrative in my life and I kind of went to break it down and realized that it's actually a bit of a paradox where the, all those things tie together pretty strongly in my life. And this is the, this is the idea that I'm pretty passionate about, which is, you know, when I really looked at it um, and as the evolution of my, you know, dad life and my professional career and myself, um, I found that, you know, I was trying to be raise and create superhumans and that all, you know, tied together. And there's some really strong physiologic examples of that where, um, you know, I'm, I'm wearing a continuous glucose monitor. I monitor my, I'm not diabetic, but I want to know my blood glucose level at all times because we know with evidence that that's the strongest predictor of our long-term cardiovascular risk of our neurodegenerative, um, you know, like Alzheimer's, of um, getting cancer. That's our strongest predictor of that. So that's an easy thing for me to extrapolate over to my patients. Like, hey, let's do this for you. We can help improve your health span, your lifespan, whatever that may be. But then on the flip side of that with your kids, it's like you don't want to be the weird dad who doesn't let their kids have four pieces of cake at the birthday party. Uh, but I know with really strong evidence there that um, our exposure to glucose and insulin when we're kids is our strongest predictor of insulin resistance later in life. So how my kids are exposed to sugar then is gonna determine what their you know, blood glucose regulation is now, like I'm doing, trying to regulate, and how that's gonna work forward in their life. And so, you know, that's a really strong physiologic tie-in. Um, you know, and there's other less physiologic examples, more process-based, you know, always having tried to be sort of like a polymath where I have this wide breath so that I can dive deep into those things I'm passionate about, you know, from a career standpoint or personal standpoint, that's easy to take to your kids, right? We know that um, kids that are sort of allowed to flourish in these environments where they're learning, they're learning processes instead of just answers, um, where they're able to pursue their passions and create that self-confidence that those kids do better, right? So that's easy. But then, you know, that's a harder one to explain on the, the patient side, which is, you know, when we really look at that, we know that patients that sort of approach uh, a treatment willingly uh, instead of reluctantly are going to, you know, physically do better, whether that is a cancer treatment, something devastating, whether that's a simple surgical procedure, we know that that sort of mindset and that willfulness is going gonna, is gonna to play into how they come out of it. So, you know, again, all those little things tie together. Um, but then, you know, for me, 
like I said, I have this cosmetic part of my life and that's always been like the hardest one to tie together. Um, and I have this sort of, you know, my own personal self-confidence call it, you know, is determined by how I'm functioning as a father, how I'm doing at work, you know, am, am I pursuing those passions I just talked about? Um, you know, am I doing the exercise I want to do? You know, with my patients, you know, every time I fix a defect on a nose or an eyelid or some, you know, massive hole, I know that as I'm doing that, I'm influencing that person's long-term social position, how they're viewing themselves, how other people are viewing them based off the sort of how that part of their face functions. That's just the nature of the area that I work. But then you get over to these cosmetic things where it's a little bit more taboo to talk about. Like, you know, um, it, it, and this has been a shifting paradigm over life, but like, you know, it used to not be okay to get your nails done and your hair done. Uh, but on the flip side of that, that's sort of changed. But now things like, you know, someone has some sun damage and some wrinkles and I'm doing a laser resurfacing procedure to rejuvenate them, basically biohacking their own, you know, physiologic response to an injury to sort of improve the way that they look and feel about themselves and reduce their cancer risk. And, it, you know, that's a little bit harder to accept for whatever reason. Um, and, you know, as you extrapolate that, that down to your kids, um, you know, I think that their self-confidence is ironically strongly linked to those other things we just talked about, you know, how they're learning their systems, how they're functioning, how they're feeling, how you're treating them. And, and so, you know, again, that's another one of those, like, that was a really hard one for me to sort of bring through, but all those things tie together and just, you know, creating self-confidence in yourself and your, for me, my patients are in your kids. And, you know, I think that this matters to the community as a whole, because um, I don't think it matters if you're talking about patients or projects or, you know, your, your creations, if you're an artist or your writing or your deals, if you're in sales or your daily labor, or whatever your daily passions, like, I think it doesn't have to be patients. I think all those things apply together. Um, and on the flip side, I don't think it applies strictly to kids either. Um, I think it's how you view yourself, your relationships, your teams. And so, you know, you're on a mission to create yourself as a superhuman and, you know, a, maybe a super deal or a, you know, a super creation on one end and then a super team or a super relationship on the other. And they really all tie together. And, you know, I think this is what I would kind of want people to leave understanding and knowing. And I think it's something that we all know on some level that is sort of how that, in that central portion of that, how you're functioning and treating yourself um, is going to be the most important thing to create what is otherwise a finite capacity to uh, improve these other things around you that you're passionate about, whether that's your kids or your relationships or your teams, or whether that is your work or your output or your deals or anything on the other end, that, you know, how you're sort of functioning in that central portion um, is, is going to really help, you know, expand that capacity, not just in a direct relationship, but just in how much you have to give. And, you know, again, that's another one of those things that's been a little bit taboo, like, you know, self-care is a spa day or things like that, but so we're um, going to have to leave it there. All right. Sounds Thank you good. very much. We'll have to listen for more. No worries. Do we have questions out there for? Uh... Yeah, Mike, I've got a question for Cameron. Sure. Uh, this is Jamie Tender. Um, appreciate you um, spending the time with us this afternoon. My question for you is, if you had to put a title on your talk, um, can you can you give us an idea of what you might title this thing? yeah i would probably do something along the, along the lines of like uh creating superhumans dichotomies of a dad and doctor that was sort of my thought that i had great okay thank you yeah all right thank you very much cameron yeah, thanks guys all righty um let's move on to our next one Looking which is for... uh janet and molly is that correct yes so let's see janet janet Unmute one, unmute two. Okay, you both should be good to go. Oh, just kidding, unmute. There, there, I'm unmuted now. Uh, Molly, can you unmute yourself? It doesn't look like it's letting me do that. Okay, we ready? Mo yeah, Molly is going to um, start. Good evening. I am Molly Kretschmar Hendricks, professor of psychology from Gonzaga University, where I teach courses in developmental psychology, risk and resilience, and attachment theory. I joined the faculty at Gonzaga in the fall of 1994, and shortly thereafter was asked by a colleague to assist her in the evaluation of a new foster care program, the Children's Arc. That invitation set the trajectory of my scholarship 
for the majority of my career. Through that work, I had the good fortune of meeting and working with Janet Mann, who has inspired me in so many ways. Janet is the founder of the Children's Ark and is truly a remarkable woman. She has made me both a better parent and a better person. Over the years, Janet and I have collaborated on a number of writing projects. Our writing culminated in a book, Creating Compassionate Foster Care, Lessons of Hope from Children and Families in Crisis, which was published by Jessica Kingsley in June 2017. Let me now pass this to Janet. Our foster care journey began in 1988. Over the next six years, my husband Paul and myself cared for, loved, and transitioned to permanent homes over 40 foster babies and toddlers. We became convinced over that period of time that if the state of Washington was serious about reuniting young foster children and their families, that we needed to figure out a way to keep them together safely. This belief was bolstered by stories like Rosie's. Rosie was a young mom who got caught up in a cycle of domestic violence, poverty, and drug abuse. She lost all three of her children to foster care. The two older girls were placed with their grandmother, Rosie's mother, who, where Rosie also lived, and the baby boy was placed in a nearby foster home. Although the foster family was generous with visitation, Rosie reports not feeling like her son's mother in the foster home. And so she visited less and less frequently. Rosie overcame major hurdles and eventually regained custody of her three children. She then made the heart-wrenching decision, however, to relinquish her parental rights to her baby boy so that the foster family could adopt him. Their fragile bond had simply been irreparably broken as a result of the separation, an outcome I'm sure nobody intended. This conviction became the catalyst for the creation of the Children's Ark, an intense, comprehensive, long-term, early intervention program serving children in foster care two years old and younger and their families. So our big idea to begin with was to keep young children in foster care and their parents together during the evaluation and treatment process while guaranteeing the safety of the children. After 15 years immersed in the lives and struggles of ARC families, however, a bigger idea emerged. That relationship is the agent for change. Without genuine relationship, it really doesn't matter what else you do because you're not going to be heard. I'm passionate about this idea because it was a lived experience, learned in immersion, and for me became life altering. I believe we should all be invested in better outcomes for children in foster care. Additionally, focusing on the quality of all of our, all of our relationships should permeate every aspect of our lives and is the source of our well-being and happiness. So if we are interested in real life-altering change in the lives of people in crisis of any age, we need to focus less on strategies, techniques, and quick fixes, and focus more on compassionate presence. Until we see, hear, understand, and stand beside those we serve, change is impossible. 
In terms of the impact of our talk, we want the audience to understand that relationship is the very essence of the healing and transformational process. It was when families felt joined rather than judged that we saw the greatest change. We want people to understand that the family crises that put children at risk are not solved by quick fixes like parenting or anger management classes. Instead, we need to meet people where they are and to do for them what we want them to do for their children. We need to create a compassionate holding environment in which they can do the work they need to do to parent safely. Over the long term, we hope for more relationship-based services in which we join families in crisis, and we hope to reimagine child welfare in ways that are less reactive and punitive and more proactive and empowering. Thank you. Just me clapping. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, uh, Jen and Molly. Um, do we have a question or two for the speakers? I've got one on, I guess, the presentation. Uh, I know that you're, you're Yeah, you've kind of gone away. Am I still there? Charlie, yeah, you're cutting in and out. Can you type the question? Yep. We can read it. Yeah. Put it in the chat. I just have a logistic question. Like, how does the two, how do two present together? What does that look like on stage? Is it a, I mean, is that a back and forth? Is it a, how does that, I'm just curious. I think that's where Charlie was going, but yeah, that's a good <laughs> question, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, Molly and I have um, presented uh, uh, specifically about the book. Um, in a number of places around the country. And so we're used to presenting together. <laughs> um, and generally, I think that is what, what happens is a little back and forth. Uh, uh, I tend to be the storyteller and Molly tends to be uh, the scientist, so to speak. But Super Molly, cool. do you want to address that? Super cool. Yeah, so we thought that I would kind of provide the frame. I'd sort of start with maybe, um, you know, kind of the, the, I guess the sort of theoretical frame, the, imagine if or imagine this and then Janet would come in and, and tell the story and then I might wrap up at the end. Charlie wrote in a question that says, uh, do you expect to have uh, visuals, data points, PowerPoint, uh, steps mm -hmm. and processes, that kind of thing? Uh, sir, oh, sorry, Janet. Certainly PowerPoint slides, I think with some really nice visuals. Uh, for a, um, a wide audience, I think a little maybe less of the data. <laughs> Certainly the key ideas from science and theory. Um, my expertise, as I mentioned, is attachment theory. Uh, but I probably we won't go too much into the data heavy piece. Mm -hmm. What's been really compelling are the examples, the stories that really highlight our key points and keep getting back to that big idea. Yeah, and I tend in, in these present, in presentations that we've made to have a, a very, very simple slides, primarily pictures of the kids I'm talking about. Good, with thank their, you. With, with their permission. Yeah. <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, any other questions out there? Thank you both. Good, thank you. Uh, so if both of you could mute yourselves, and then Katie, I will unmute you. I think we are good to go. Oh, just sorry, I'm joining late. I had some Wi-Fi difficulties. No problem, Dan. Um, there is Katie and Thomas in front of you, and then we'll let you know when you're up. Okay, thank you. No problem. Katie? Uh my name is Katie and I am a Gonzaga University a student in the doctoral program in leadership studies. I currently live in California with my academic administrator as a husband and my son, but I did my undergraduate at Whitworth University 
my graduate studies at Gonzaga University, and now my PhD at Gonzaga University. I'm gonna share a little of our story and how it has shaped my work this last decade. Now imagine for a moment that you have your life in order. You're at the height of an established career, you own your own business, a home, you're newly married, and you're feeling secure enough to expand your family with a child. One day, you get very sick while pregnant, critically sick with preeclampsia. I was new to the Northwest, and my shoes were accustomed to concrete, planned parks, and robust healthcare systems. So moving into the rural part of the Northwest challenged my privileged assumptions of what healthcare should look like. My heels were sinking into unknown territory. On a December night in 2009, helicopter transports were grounded by negative one degree Fahrenheit winter blizzard. Evacuating me by helicopter meant risking the lives of a pilot, a critical care nurse, and a medic. A 100 mile highway traversing a 5,500 foot elevation pass closed due to five foot high snowbanks in a winter storm so powerful that the transport by ambulance risked the transport team and me being blown down a deep ravine. Leaving me at this rural hospital meant death. With 155 over 115 blood pressure in a state of confusion, the critical care team transported me by ground ambulance to a fixed wing plane over the 5,500 foot mountain and again by ambulance to a critical care regional hospital equipped to care for my condition. My son was born 10 weeks premature at two pounds, eight ounces. We spent 56 days in the neonatal intensive care unit, far from home. This event altered the course of my life. It led me on an academic quest to better understand the intricacies of navigating life when it is hard. This profound experience led me to pursue both graduate and doctoral studies at Gonzaga University. The heart of my work is focusing attention on the 50% burnout rate among healthcare providers and its relationship to patient and family outcomes. Provider burnout is correlated with physician cynicism, depression, turnover rates, and even suicide. We know that provider burnout is associated with it, to patient compliance and in taking prescriptions and the self-care necessary to heal. For patients, it's poor patient outcomes such as disease, complications, and even death. This experience led to my life's work of helping healthcare providers and disability professionals shift from a position of burnout to well-being. My life experiences, including academic and professional ones, have given me the knowledge and tools to facilitate individual, organizational, and societal change. My idea is that as we improve the 50% burnout rate among healthcare providers, we will see an improvement in patient and family outcomes. As patients are healthier, wiser, freer, and more autonomous, they will therefore be able to serve others. This may include serving as a health healthcare as a patient partner or a parent-led organizational leader. It might mean being strengthened to serve their family, their society, and whatever makes up their world. I am passionate about my big idea because I spent the last decade caring for my son, who has been treated by many different healthcare organizations. The rural hospital in the Northwest lacked the interpersonal leadership skills of active listening and empathy that would help me feel safe in their care. This distrust and fear led to post-traumatic stress disorder and postpartum depression. The regional hospital where we spent 56 days practiced patient care that led me to feel listened to, genuinely cared for, and have relationships that helped me rediscover my courage and the skills that I needed to confidently care for my child. At the core of who I am, I believe that every person on earth deserves this experience and to be cared for. And knowing that the burnout rate is at 50% breaks my heart. Others should care about my big idea because everyone is touched by healthcare at some point in their life and they expect a positive healthcare experience. Society is often impacted by inspirational stories of childhood success. It's not always easy to see the connection between healthcare provider well being and improved healthcare outcomes among patients and families. By motivating listeners through our story of a successful healthcare outcome, we're tapping into a narrative many people feel comfortable with while also inviting systemic change. 
I hope the impact of my talk will bring attention to the relationship between healthcare provider burnout rates and healthcare outcomes of patients, families, and society as a whole. Healthcare providers are at the heart of our healthcare system. For me, instead of focusing on the system being broken, my focus is on equipping every clinical provider with the leadership tools and skills to transform their individual healthcare system. The rate of prematurity in children with disabilities is increasing each year, with healthcare research pointing to health equity and social determinants of health as a leading cause. I hope healthcare leaders, clinicians, and society will invest in healthcare provider burnout rates first. Then we'll see healthcare and society as a whole be transformed. Few in life can note the exact dates when the course of their life changed. For me, it was December 8th of 2009. The silver lining is that even in the darkness, even the cold darkness, light exists. My goal is to share that light with others. It needs only to be uncovered and shared. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Do we have a question out there? Yeah, I got a question. Um, Katie, how um, do you present the methods to instilling this leadership and reducing the, the burnout rate? Um, are there steps? Um, are there examples? Is there a formula that you've developed? And I'll stop there. I am working on my doctorate right now. So that will be something that, um, but what I'm finding right now is what I hear from a lot of people. I use our story as a vehicle to help create change. So I talk about characteristics of listening, empathy, healing, awareness, many of the characteristics that refer to uh, an idea called servant leadership. Thank you. I love that, that's super cool. there? Yeah, real quick question, that's super cool. As a physician, I love that. Um, are you, is this targeted towards certain demographics of physicians or specialties or anything like that, knowing the burnout rates are so different with different specialties? I use our story, which is a pediatric based story, but really anybody can withdraw information from it. So it's something that can be globally applicable. Uh, and I, so I use our story as that vehicle. Um, a lot of the work that I've been doing is with NICU and pediatrics, though I've also had an opportunity to work with some emergency room physicians. And when I share my story, they, they see applicability in their work as well. Thank you. Any others? All right, thank you very much. Thomas, are we ready? Let's see. Unmute Thomas. All righty, I think we're good. Okay, how's, how's the audio sound? Good to me. Okay, very good. Um, Hi, so uh, first quickly about myself, I'm a professor at Montana Tech, and I've been here since 2011. Uh, before that, I worked in Spokane for most of my adult life, and so that's where my roots are there. I've got to give you a little bit of background academically. I've got a PhD from the University of Idaho. I also have a master's degree in engineering management from Washington State, and I also studied in the leadership studies program at Gonzaga, the doctoral program, never finished that second dissertation, but I took all the classes. So that led to research I did uh, right through the present moment, actually. And um, as far as my roots in Spokane go, uh, my daughter's still there with her family. She's a school teacher there as well as her husband. And I tell people that I currently live in Butte, but my home is in Spokane, and I have every intention of returning to Spokane when I'm done teaching here, whatever that might be. So my big idea is uh, actually a nice segue from what Katie was talking about toward the end of her speech. She was talking about servant leadership. Uh, my big idea is to talk about the dark side of servant leadership. I've always had an interest in the dark side of uh, leadership, dysfunctional leadership, which probably is a reflection on some of my own idiosyncrasies, but also it's so prevalent in organizations and it's something that needs to be addressed. 
I, um, I'm just finishing up a sabbatical year right now, and I've spent most of this year over in Spokane, actually, working with a couple of colleagues over there. And what caused me to propose giving this presentation is part of my work is, has been with Shan Furch, a professor over there, and he asked me to write a paper for the um, International Journal of Servant Leadership, which was published last fall on this topic area. And I've been doing some more research on it since then. And the particular aspect or model that I like to use is Carl Jung's idea of the shadow in our personality. It's one of many useful tools talking about leadership, talking about how the human condition. If you're wondering why is an engineer talking about Jung's shadow? Well, one of the things that engineers look at is we look at human factors when we look at any kind of design. And that's an area I've specialized in. So I teach the management classes and the economic classes in our curriculum over here in uh, Montana Tech. And during my sabbatical, I've been working with Shan, looking at specific aspects of leadership and how we can use Jung's archetypes and particularly the shadow aspect to describe some of the dysfunctions we see in organizations. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with servant leadership, one of its main functions is to concentrate on the leader facilitating the growth of the people that they're responsible for and to create an environment where people can be the best that they can be within that environment. Well, it's hard for a leader to be that way if they have personal issues that they haven't dealt with. So when you look at Jung's idea on the shadow and how that applies to dysfunctional leadership, it can explain a lot of things that we try to uh, try to deal with. For instance, uh, one thing you see with people who want to be effective leaders, including a servant leader, is they try to be uh, a father figure. Well, in a positive aspect, that's really good, but a negative aspect of a, someone that tries to be a father figure is it tends to come across as very paternalistic. And if they're not addressing that shadow side of their personality, then they may think they know more than the people that they're in charge of and think that they know what's best for them. And so that positive aspect of having a, a parenting aspect can quickly turn dysfunctional because it can come across as being uh, condescending or manipulative. And the thing is, if the leader isn't aware that they have that, that condition, if they aren't aware that they're projecting that onto their, the people that they're responsible for, then they're a servant leader in words only. They really aren't manifesting itself in a proper way or in a, a holistic way. Um, a quote that I've written, a couple of things I'll bring up and that I really like, Parker Palmer, which some of you may be familiar with his writings, he talks about how leaders have to be aware of their light side and their shadow side. And if, they're, if, if they project their light side, you're going to see that positive aspects of leadership. But if they're projecting that dark side, then that's, it's, they're not going to be an effective leader and they're going to be, it's going to be to the detriment of their people. I see we're running short on time, so I'll, one quote that I think that really wraps this up, the thing I'd want to look at in my presentation, is a quote from a performer named Amanda Palmer, as far as I know, no relation to Parker Palmer. She said, if you don't deal with your demons, they go into the cellar of your soul and lift weights. And I really like that quote because it encapsulates what Jung talked about too. He said, if we don't address that shadow aspect of our personality, that dark aspect of our personality, that doesn't mean it goes away. It just mean it means it manifests itself in a really uh, dark and often uh, dysfunctional and even um, you know, harmful way. So, so that's what I would want people to, to take away from the talk is the fact that there is a light aspect to this. If you learn how to address the shadow side of your personality and you learn how to integrate it into your personality, you can have a more whole sense of who, you're, who you are as yourself and it can be a positive not only for you, but the people you work with.
Thank you. I was waiting for, there we go, for Mike to cue Thank in. Thank you very much, yeah. Um, do we have any questions out there for uh, Thomas? Sorry, I feel like I'm the only person asking questions, but I love this. The, that's, I was a collegiate athlete and our uh, coach was all about serving leadership. So I cannot wait to, to send this idea on because it's kind of fun always to have, you know, the other side of something. But so when you're, I mean, is this talk encompass sort of um, examples of those dark sides? I mean, like. Yeah, that, yes, it would. And you know, I, didn't, I didn't have time to do it in the overview. What yeah. I addressed in the paper and hopefully what I would be able to address in the talk is looking at what I, in the paper I called it, I'm not totally happy with this, but I called it dark, darker, and darkest. So the dark aspect of it is just people who don't know, they're kind of clueless and they're ineffective. So the, um, the boss, and I don't know if you remember the show, The Office, uh, the boss that was there, he was always trying to do the right thing, but he was, it was almost painful to watch how bad he was at being a manager, but it was because he didn't understand. And then the darker aspect would be what I alluded to quickly, like the paternalistic approach where the dark side of that comes across as being very condescending and even manipulative rather than being nurturing. And then of course the darkest aspect, would, which is, and this is an area that I've written several papers on, given presentations on, is the narcissistic personality. And that's by far the most destructive, the most exploitative, and that's the darkest aspect of it. And narcissists manifest the shadow, the dark aspect of their personality in often really harmful and dysfunctional ways. So, so yes, I would, I would make a point to get into specific examples for a full-blown presentation. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, anything else out there? All right, thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Okay, I think Dan was next. Yes. And then just a quick note while we switch over to Dan, um, I sent a chat to the whole group with, um, we're welcoming your feedback if you're with us on Zoom on all of the auditions. So there should be a link in there that will click you through to a form. Um, if you don't get it, again, I'm Haley, send me a message privately and I'll send you the link. All righty, Dan. All right, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. I will turn myself off and you are good to go. My first call is Quis Coplacinum Cla. I just want to acknowledge and show my gratitude for your time. Um, my name is Dan Nanamkin. My Indian name is Coplacinum Cla which means thunder and lightning. I'm here in Nespelum, Washington, a member of the Colville Confederated Tribes and the Nez Perce people from the Chief Joseph Band of Wallawa. Um, my great, great grandmother, she was a storyteller. Her name was uh, Christine Quintasket and uh, she was the first Native American author and um, one quote that she said, and I'm just going to quote her, her name was Morning Dove. And uh, she said, everything on the earth has a purpose. Every disease, a herb to cure it. And every person, a mission. This is the Indian theory of existence. She's been a great influence on my life. So as a young boy, I started to learn our stories. Our, these are our natural laws and um, a lot of the values that we live as uh, indigenous people of the First Nations of this area. And I've been a teacher. I teach kids and I've shared with them the stories and culture of our people. Last few years have been really interesting. I was over at the front lines of Standing Rock and uh, so I was on a lot of the videos and documentaries and things that you've seen of, of Standing Rock. But more so afterwards, I've been traveling across the nation as a speaker, presenter, just like with the flute, performing artist. And um, the story that I hope to share, if I'm selected here with you following folks, is how food was given. And within this story, it talks about uh, um, our relationship to the land, 
to the medicines, to the things that sustain our health and wellness. You know, you see our foods, you see all the things here in nature, the plants, the medicines, and our sacred connection to all life. These things are often overlooked, and, um, and especially in our educational systems, the values. But we're living in a time of uncertainty, a time where a lot of people have fear, and um, they also worry about the food systems ahead of us. And um, these are, I guess you would say, passages and connections, a bridge from our ancestors and from the creator that to put us here on this piece of earth that we live on and that we are caretakers but more so with the stories it has a perspective of unity and hope that uh, broadens our perspective and understanding of life and a lot of the fear that people are are fearing right now is they think that they're alone and just like with the toilet paper shortage, they, they think there's never gonna be enough, but the earth sustains us. If we learn to appreciate the earth, if we learn to appreciate the animals, the medicines, and all the things that are here to take care of us. So this is just an important story of creating that uh, alignment, the sacred alignment from our ancestors to right now and beyond. How do we live together? How do we have um, the sacred uh, respect to the environment and to the earth? So I'm not a person who likes to talk about themselves. So I asked some people um, on my Facebook, because I do these presentations, and I said, well, what are some ideas and thoughts that you guys would think why you would like to hear this. So I'm just going to read a couple statements um, just that people have said. To ensure the survival of everyone and children, um, critical thinking, open and touch, change uh, operations, um, provide solidarity and ground and force for what's truly important understand how to connect to our world and each other. And uh, people are hungry to um, hear the truth. So to inspire and give hope for a collective future. Them are some of the things I, I asked when I said, well, why would you like to hear this? So to answer that question, um, just to, my hope is just to continue the work of being that voice for those who cannot speak for themselves, which is our plants, the animals, and the water, you know, the sacred water, and uh, our culture, because our voices never heard. How many times have you ever heard these sacred stories from the indigenous First Nations people of this land? It's very rare, but had we listened, we probably wouldn't have a lot of these problems that we're facing right now. So I have a wonderful opportunity, you know, to share these words with you. And I, I love to have fun and I love to, you know, be engageful. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of different topics I love to talk about. And this is just one that struck me, you know, concerning our current situation and uh, the humanity, you know, of the people and the fear and the personal struggles, you know, that are, obviously going to get much worse in time. So this is something to give hope, you know, for our future and for our children and create these sec sacred relationships, you know, with all people in humanity, but creating a circle of connection that's even beyond us, the circle of unity that must include the earth, that must include the water and all things that live here on the earth. That's that reminder. And that's what I come here to do today. So. Thank you, Dan. Questions for Dan? I've got one, Dan. 
Do you, you imagine your presentation is going to be mostly focused on telling stories or mostly focused on telling about the impact of stories? It's going to have a, I, I, 17 minutes is a pretty tough challenge for me. But so I did some tests on it and uh, I, I, the story is a definite intricate part, but it just to make it concise and then we go into the education of beyond, you know, just uh, the story. So the story is a part of it, yes. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, I've got a question. I, um, Dan, thank you for your presentation and, and sharing your big idea. Um, it made me think when you're talking about the nature, the pictures that we see online of major cities uh, during these closures and the, um, how clear the skies are and, and improving things. What are other, like, I, I don't know how to even phrase the question, but is, is, would you tie some of those pieces in? Um, you, you had mentioned, the reason I asked that is because you mentioned about current times and, and the challenges that we're facing currently. Do you, how would you maybe fit those together with this pandemic or other things happening right now? Well, uh, my, my understanding is we would have like a coach, right, to work with. And that's what I would uh, like to do is, okay, what are some really key things that we could focus in on and, and talk about, you know, and be really main discussion topics. You know, I, like I said, I, I speak on a huge uh, wide range of topics, but I just thought this one was um, really specific to where we're at. And I would definitely like to work with someone on seeing, okay, what are some key points here that you would really like to hit? And so I'd work with that timing to be able to create that space. I mean, I'm, I, I would definitely love to work with a, a speaking coach, you know, that would really enhance, you know, my delivery. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions out there? All right, thank you, Dan. Well, thank you, thank you all. Um, just in closing, um, you know, I, I've been doing some acting and I'm actually writing a book right now. So hope to share that with you guys. Have awesome. a good day. Thank you. Okay, Wolfgang. Let's see, I will unmute you. Oh. Like I unmuted now. Can everybody hear me? Thumbs up. I can hear you, which I think Good. is great. Thank you, Haley. Yeah, here you go. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Weber. Um, I have been a, an active duty military officer in the Air Force for the last 12 years. And beyond that, currently for the last three years, I actually have been an educator. I am currently a professor of law and negotiations at the United States Air Force Academy. Um, I know right off the bat that one of the elephants in the room typically is, wow, that guy looks super young. I get it. I have been mistaken numerous times throughout my university for a student rather than a professor. Um, but I can assure you I have, I have the, I have the credentials necessary to be in the front of the room. Um, so I wanted to say very quickly, thank you guys all. Um, I'm very excited to even have this opportunity. I love TED Talks. I love what they do for their community. Mike, Charlie, Haley, Jamie, Guy, thank you guys all so much for your time um, and everything that you're doing to make this the very best event possible. Um, so a little bit more about me just to, um, during that 12 years of military time, I have gotten an opportunity to go in and out of Spokane. I have lived in Spokane as well as gotten an opportunity to visit there. My best friend lives there as well, and I am very excited to be here. Thank you guys so much. So let's jump to it. Um, my big idea. So my big idea actually entails a pretty small life change. Um, as a law professor, as a negotiations professor, I, I talk to my young students who are going to be going off and being military officers a lot about similar things that Thomas and Katie talk about a lot in their studies, those leadership-oriented studies. 
one of the things that I have gotten feedback repeatedly from my students more than anything is this small change that they have found has made the most lasting impact in their military careers. It is an idea that will, if, made, if you make this change, will allow people to trust you more, respect you more, like you more. It has no need for any kind of cost. It has no need for any kind of additional training. And it is just a small change. That small change, that big idea succinctly, is we need to be better in this world about making it a priority to learn people's names. I see Katie smiling there, I see Thomas smiling there because it is such a small idea, I get it. But the reality is we can better ourselves and the world around us by taking the time to learn and remember names, especially the names of those from different cultural backgrounds. Now, some of you guys might be thinking right away, duh, Wolfgang, I know that I'm supposed to remember names. That's obvious to me. You aren't giving me any groundbreaking kind of material. Well, I admittedly nerd out on TED Talks and I've come to realize that many times some of the best TED Talks aren't about telling people something they don't already know. It's about inspiring them to act on what they already know. It's about inspiring them to remember, to take the time to legitimately remember when they shake the hand or wave in during these times of COVID and say and introduce themselves. It's about acting upon taking the time to remember when you meet your new foreign colleague who has a little bit of a unique name. And instead of just quickly giving them a nickname, asking them to spell it out asking them to pronounce it for you a second or third time so you can legitimately say it back to them. Now, I know this is not earth sharing, but one, one way I like to give this example to a lot of my students is this. I have a question for all of you out there in Zoom and the other presenters can raise their, hand, raise their hands and participate as well if they want. Has anybody ever heard the excuse I'm sorry, I'm bad with names. Show of hands, anybody? Now I want you to imagine for a moment. I want you to imagine for a moment that I walk up to that person. I know none of you are guilty of this, but say hypothetically you knew somebody who was. I walk up to that person, I say, hey listen, I want you to walk across the street right now and I want you to introduce yourself to that stranger. And if you remember their name this next month for the entirety of this next month, I'll give you a million dollars. You think that person who is bad with names is still gonna be bad with names or are they gonna miraculously learn to remember? What it comes down to, what the reality comes down to is it's not about people actually being bad with names. It's about people not properly prioritizing their importance in this society. In a society of social media, where we are jumping from Facebook account to Twitter account to Instagram account, where we are more likely to look at somebody's pictures on their Instagram than actually have a face-to-face -face conversation with them, it has become easy in society for us to, to forget about the importance of a name. And I wanna say that that is us as a society missing out on a golden opportunity. A golden opportunity to take a moment in time to establish a genuine connection with the people we're interacting with. There's a Harvard study that shows that 47% of our waking hours are spent thinking about something other than what we're doing in the present. 
we are constantly thinking about everything else besides what is in front of us. And we're missing out on opportunities to interact with people in a way that makes them feel special. And as a result, allows us to enhance our own lives and make this world a warmer, more caring place in general. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, do we have a question for Wolfgang out there? I'm gonna try again. Let me know if it's jarbled. With your students, do you envision telling this story and relaying it? I'm a jumping to an assumption that your students have had a positive reaction from the lesson um, and they've come back to tell you about that story. How would you present the success or the failure of this hypothesis? That's a great question, Charlie. I have admittedly several anecdotes and stories that I would love to share with you guys, but you, you handcuffed me and you only gave me seven minutes, so I couldn't share any of those with you today. But I have a number of stories and anecdotes that I, could, that I would love to share. I think in a lot of ways, those are some of the most inspirational ways to pass along that knowledge. And if I'm given the opportunity to work with a coach, I would love to share those stories and sort of pick out which ones you all find to be the most inspirational and you find to be the ones that could help garner the most um, effective, e effective lessons from those inspirational stories. Nice. Anything else? Thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you, guys. Okay. Okay, here we Welcome go. Welcome everybody back and let's go. Hello, TEDx committee. My name is Brooke Matson, and I am a poet, a writer, a book designer, the executive director of Spark Central, a nonprofit dedicated to igniting creativity. I'm a national board certified teacher and many other things, which is part of the reason I'm giving this talk. What if I told you that about a tenth of the US population are born with brains genetically wired for profound creativity? These rare individuals have the same brain traits that allowed Sir Richard Branson to found 26 companies, including the Virgin Mobile, uh, Virgin Mobile and Virgin Airlines, Lisa Ling to win awards for her investigative journalism and authorship, Jamie Oliver to be a master chef and a health pioneer. And experts think it's even what allowed Einstein to publish his more than 300 scientific papers, some of which were revolutionary. And while tests for this trait didn't exist in Einstein's time, many experts now agree he fits the description. And they also think Leonardo da Vinci, Mozart, Virginia Woolf, Pablo Picasso, and many other greats possessed brains with the same trait. Now you may be thinking you want to hire someone with that creative trait or invest in their startup venture or become a patron of their next art project, and you should. So it may surprise you that today such people are told their brain is disordered and that far from having any kind of special talent, they have a mental deficit. That there is something wrong with a brain that has a relentless need to innovate and create. All of the individuals I mentioned are diagnosed with or are believed to have had ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder it is a terrible name but i'll get to that later when i was diagnosed with adhd at age 35 which is common for women i at first felt overwhelming shock and shame the words deficient and disordered haunted me so i began reading and i haven't really stopped reading since then about how adhd brains work how we're different and I began writing about it and studying myself. And I realized that our so-called deficits are the very traits that allow us to be exceptionally creative. For me, they're what made me an award-winning poet at the same time as I was the founding executive director of a nonprofit that grew very fast, a small business entrepreneur, a national board certified teacher, 
a tango dancer, a book designer, and many other titles because being ADHD, I have a relentless need to explore new horizons and do what I haven't done before. So I've decided I don't like the name, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, which even doctors agree is misleading because there is no attention deficit in ADHD. It's that we focus on things other people don't want us to. And at times, they don't want us to. We are a square peg in a world designed for round ones. The world expects us to operate on a step-by-step -step outline, but the ADHD brain is a choose-your-own-adventure book. My big idea is that far from being disordered, those of us with ADHD have brains that are audacious, driven, and hyper-creative by design. My new abbreviation for ADHD. We are born to explore, to break the status quo set before us and shape the world to our relentless imaginations. Because our brains have an overactive default mode network, which I'll explain in my TED talk, we see possibilities like that kid in the sixth sense sees dead people. They are everywhere and they are constantly talking to us, usually when you are talking to us about something really important to you, not to us, to you. Our workplaces, our schools, our businesses, and even our hospitals need people who are ADHD to share these constant ideas, to test if they work, to innovate and create a future full of new inventions, systems, and artistic works that benefit everyone. But the very institutions who need our creativity are often the same ones requiring we conform to standard procedure, to think linearly instead of outside the box, to stay seated despite having a brain that is powered by movement and to repeat and repeat what has already been done instead of aggressively innovating, which we are wired to do. In my TEDx talk, I want to do what those of us who are ADHD do best, break the rules and explore an innovative view of the ADHD brain's creative superpowers. It's time to leave behind the stigma and embrace a brain positive model. I'll share what makes the ADHD brain a super powered creativity machine and why it's time to welcome us into leadership roles where we can innovate and steer us into the future. My hope is that this new perspective on ADHD, audacious, driven, and hyper creative by design, will shift the narrative from disordered to superpowered so that one day ADHD children will be invited to reimagine our, excuse me so that one day ADHD children will be invited to reimagine existing institutions systems whole industries and to create new ones from a very early age why wait thanks for your consideration Thank you, Brooke. Um, Brooke couldn't be here tonight, so she submitted by video. So um, alas, we can't really uh, give Brooke any questions in person. But if anybody had a question for Brooke, they could type it into the chat and we could get that to her. So I'll give just a moment for anyone who wants to uh, submit a chat question for Brooke if you have one. And uh, if not, we'll get ready to queue up Michael. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, Michael Gurian, I live here in Spokane, um, and I'm I'm uh, so glad this has come about and honored to be considered. I most of my work is done elsewhere; it's done around the country or or elsewhere around the world, and I don't get to do much in Spokane, so uh, my own hometown. So thanks for inviting me to audition. Um, my most recent book is called The Stone Boys. It's about two boys who are sexually abused. Um, it's it's uh, one of the characters is autobiographical, and um, uh, I'm a, I'm a marriage and family counselor. I've been in private practice for 30 years and written um, a number of books, over 30 books. 
And uh, in each of them, I've talked a little about, in some of them, sexual abuse. But this book, The Stone Boys, is all about sexual abuse of boys. And um, uh, I, myself, at 10, was, uh, I'm a survivor of sexual abuse. So at 10, I was kind of a hellion boy. And my parents did what was considered the smart thing then. Uh, I went to a psychiatrist. And um, uh, the psychiatrist ended up grooming me and ended up abusing me. So throughout my life, throughout my adult life, um, that has been something always in the back of my mind. And a lot of my professional work is in trauma-informed education. And, um, uh, and it took me 40 years to actually publish a whole book on this. And you can imagine why, because it's a very difficult topic. From the age of 16 to 26, I was in therapy and I consider myself very lucky. It's part of why I am a therapist. Uh, but we have around one in six, we think um, that might, you know, might be too high, but certainly one in 10 um, American males, just American males who have been sexually abused. And it's a significant trauma. And the trauma affects males differently than females. The male and the female brain, as, as some folks will know, are set up differently, formatted differently, processed emotion differently, uh, remember differently. So um, I spent a lot of my life in that area. A lot of my books are in, in gender neuroscience and trauma and sexual abuse fits in that category. So what I, what I would love to do is, um, is condense a talk that I give elsewhere, condense it for the 17 minutes and really dig in with people on, on what has to happen to help these males um, heal from sexual abuse. Because if they don't, if we don't give them the services they need and we don't give them the help, most will not ask for help. Uh, so if we don't understand them and give it to them, that's a large percentage of males who are hurting and hurt others and hurt themselves. And it's kind of a hidden, um, epidemic's a bad word to use at this moment, but um, won't be as, as bad maybe in October. It's a hidden epidemic uh, in terms of substance abuse, male depression, male anxiety, um, uh, and down the line, which then impacts relationships and families. So one thing I'll, I'll point out, like in this audition, I'll certainly talk about it. And when I do the talk, or if I do the talk, I'll show brain scans. Um, my audiences really love brain scans. They find them fascinating. And I'll show male brain, female brain. People will be able to see the difference between the way that male and female brains process emotions. Um, uh, a couple things that that sometimes shock people, but then they realize it's common sense, is when when women are, are raped and sexually abused, um, they generally are raped and sexually abused by a male. And, um, uh, and in exploring this, obviously, sexual abuse and rape is terrible for anybody. So this isn't comparing sufferings. It's understanding the brain. Um, when males are sexually abused, they are almost always abused by a male. So both females and males are abused by males. Um, for males, it's a double whammy because most males who are sexually abused are heterosexual. So it creates a lot of difficulty, years and years of trauma and trauma response. And there's so much shame that most males don't seek therapy. I, I feel fortunate that I've been able to help on a lot of, of males um, in my therapy practice, as well as females. Um, but most won't seek it out. It's very threatening to them. The counseling profession isn't set up well for males. Uh, so they tend to leave and they don't get the help they need. And one reason is people don't understand that they're wired to deal with the sexual abuse somewhat differently. And especially because they came from a male and they don't understand that. Um, uh, the other thing that's very difficult that people then realize is common sense, but is very difficult is that most women who are abused or raped um, don't have, don't get pleasure from it. And, um, and I think we can say, you know, 99.9%, .9%, maybe 100% don't get pleasure from that sexual assault. But males who are sexually abused, I can say this from personal experience, males who are sexually abused as children get pleasure because part of, of the whole um, uh, grooming and part of the, the control and the power uh, from the abuser is to control male pleasure and male orgasm. So males, because of our biology, are getting pleasure. That is a second very difficult thing that like most therapists, parents, spouses who are dealing with someone who's abused, um, a male didn't, didn't think of or, or just don't realize. And it's a, it's a crucial element. And it, it's part of what creates the shame for males and keeps so many males away 
uh, in fact, keeps most males away from getting help. And then the cascade of, of drug abuse and all the issues that they face uh, later in life and in relationships. Uh, and those are just two of the, the sort of brain differences and the social emotional differences that impact uh, guys. And so I'm, my hope in doing this, I, I do this nationwide, and my hope in doing it in Spokane is going to be to present this in a way that people will, will kind of go, wow, especially when they see the brain scans and see the differences. And they'll, um, you know, anyone who's listening or hears it, who has been abused, I'm hoping will be convinced to get help. Uh, and also those people who are relating to someone who's been traumatized in this way. And remember, it's in the many, many millions, even if it's one in 10, we're talking about, you know, 17 to 25 million males in the US. Uh, anyone who's relating to them hopefully will have a deeper understanding and will be able to give them help uh, because this is a this is a massive chunk of our population uh, males traumatized and they they uh, they need the help thank you very much all right thank you thank you do we have questions for michael yeah michael um Thank you for for sharing that idea. My question is, um, I've never, and we as an educator, you hear a lot about um, different um, the impact of sexual abuse and and things to look for and things like that. This seems like new information. Is it new or is it just not talked about or presented in terms of, especially the last point about the the pleasure part of it? I think about addictions and and um, brain scans on that and how it certain sections light up um is this new or is what uh, i'm just kind of curious um it, uh the way that i present it is probably new i mean on the national circuit i don't see anyone else saying that um uh i focus on it and i partly focus on it because i experienced it and not just professionally, my client load, but personally, so I'm able to speak to it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that a that a let's say a TEDx audience or a lot of people when they hear that will say, "I've never heard that before," but then they'll say, "Oh, well, that that makes sense." Um, and and but to your second point, part of why you don't hear much about it is that it is so difficult. You know, uh, I mean, like I wrote The Stone Boys. I made sure it's a crossover to write it for adults. It's an adult novel, but I wanted it to cross over so high schools, uh, high school kids could read it. So eighth grade on up. And um, I've been hearing from our schools that that a number of them are doing that. They're doing it as an eighth grade reader, ninth grade reader, or tenth grade read. Um, and it's it's completely new to most of those teachers, and of course to the kids. Um, you know, all of them know someone who is sexually abused, but it doesn't get talked about. It is talked about in the media in terms of pre-scandals, but you don't tend to get a lot of conversation between peers. And one of the things I would like to see, since peers know what each other, you know, they, they know each other in some ways better than we know our own kids. Um, you know, I would like to see them um, also learn about this so that it isn't, it isn't new to them, so that they are able to uh, to talk about it and give their friends help, and then of course with adults, um, you know I beg every educator to learn about this because every educator is educating um, at some point in their day. They're educating. Uh, the probability is uh, a male who has been sexually traumatized at some point during their day. Um, so I don't know if it's new or not. I mean, some of what I say, yeah, is my certainly my research and. Uh, um, but luckily there are places like one in six.org, you know, there are places trying to get this message out. Uh, I think maybe I just do it in a certain way. Thank you. Any other questions? We actually got a question from Facebook. Pretty impressed with that. Nice um, job. Thank Facebook you. wants to know, and I'm reading this uh, word for word, so I hope it makes sense to you. It said, because of the prevalence of abuse, how do you protect your audience from a serious break? But um, at least I understand that question. If if or is that question saying if you talk about abuse, will someone in the audience have a a, ne a negatively profound experience? 
I did not write it, but as I read it, I understood it the same way as you. Right. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm asked that, and I think that I, I don't think anything like this needs to protect the audience. Um, the audience is quite resilient, um, and and we need to trust that resilience. The message is too important, and so we need to not sort of censor the message uh, because of the audience. And I say that as an abuse survivor, so um, I'm not you know, I'm not going to say anything. I've never said anything that actually is going to terribly trigger someone. I don't think it will. Um, uh, but at the same time, it, 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 if, if someone sees the topic, if they see the topic and it's sexual abuse of males, um, they'll, you know, they can choose not to listen uh, or not to view. But I don't think we should censor the topic because of that possibility in an, in an individual. I speak at college campuses and we're having this discussion at college campuses quite a bit about safe rooms, resilience, you know, things like that. And I, I tend to be on the side of uh, don't censor. If people feel they'll be triggered, just don't come to the talk, but we can't stop the dialogue. We got a lot of people we need to help. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Haley, we ready to go to Julie? Yes. There we go. Hello. Yes. Okay. Aloha, everybody. I'm Julie Suen. I am a Hong Kong born Chinese Canadian living in Honolulu. Um, I want to start sharing a little bit about myself um, by sharing an experience. In year 2010, I have had a profound experience um, in which I can only describe as a rebirth in life. Um, in that experience, I ran a marathon in Rome and I fundraised for um, a cause towards fighting leukemia. Um, what came out of that experience was um, I bonded with um, a lot of people who were uh, fighting to live and some others who had lost their loved ones to um, cancer, including their children. So um, from that experience onward, I had death put on the map for the first time um, in the sense that from that experience I recognized death was something that could happen to me or anybody else um, at any time. So from then on I um, changed my life significantly and um, the trajectory of my life also changed. So um, moving to Hawaii was one of those changes. Um, Professionally, I'm an attorney. I've been an attorney for almost 15 years. Um, I litigated for um, almost seven years. And in the days when I was practicing litigation, I've had the chance to um, defend death claims um, for medical malpractices. I've um, done estate litigation claims. Throughout all that experience, I've had a firsthand um, opportunity to witness how we monetized um, death, life, and even love. Um, yet, you know, pay somebody to compensate for the loss of these things um, causes us to forget that these things are sacred. So now I practice um, estate planning and um, my clients come into the office believing that um, estate planning is the main thing for them to do in order to prepare for death. Um, I don't believe that is true, which leads me to my big idea. Um, my big idea is that what we're doing to prepare for death focuses on the wrong things. When we look at our death in the, what we're not looking at is death itself. It's like we're looking at death as if it was an illness that we're paying money to try and treat to prevent um, its symptoms. I'm passionate about this idea because death is just an inevitable part of life. As with all things that exist in life, by examining why it exists, that's meaning and clarity to life. The only way that we can prepare for death is to embody it. By that, I mean living as if each moment could be our last. 
and um, recognizing that each moment is a sacred gift. Three years ago, my father died from lung cancer. Before he died, he avoided um, spending time with me for over a decade. It wasn't until he was in um, the intensive care unit that he initiated contact and wanted to spend time with me. And it wasn't until moments before he died that he asked me for forgiveness for never having spent time with me. All of us will reach a point in our lives where we will question, where did all my time go? And how did I spend it? I believe that others should care about this idea because only by embodying our mortality in taking a moment to look back at the course of our lives as if it's about to end, then we no longer procrastinate or distract ourselves from focusing on what carries meaning and importance in life. Near-death experiences substantiate this. All documented cases of those who experienced it say that they have completely lost the fear of death. 85% of the document cases also tell us that these people experience a profound positive change on their life afterwards. They live differently, they value different things, and they appreciate life at much higher levels. In my death doula training, the key thing I learned about what a death doula does is that her job is to hold sacred space for somebody who is dying. And what that means is to be sitting beside somebody who's dying, being fully present, to hold vigil, to be comfortable with that person's grief, their fear, their pain, and their suffering. My idea is to encourage audience to hold that sacred space for themselves before they're sick or they're dying. By not running away from the uncomfortable feelings around death, we can truly unravel its gifts, including becoming more passionate and gaining more clarity on what's important in life. So the impact of my talk, I'm hoping, would be for others to think about death um, differently. Since death is the inevitable ending for all of us, um, I believe it's time for us to frame it in a way that helps us recognize more um, sacredness in each of our lives. Thank you very much, Julia. I appreciate that. Do we have uh, questions for Julie? I've got one, Julie. Um, do you imagine uh, storytelling be a big part of what you do, or do you uh, a, a, in a talk, or do you imagine it going somewhat differently? I believe story is something that we don't think about very much. So Wait one uh, second, we we lost about ten okay. seconds there. Can you go back to the beginning of that question? Okay, I believe storytelling would be an important part of this just because we don't think about fact the death very much in our lives. So story will help add context and understanding so that we can relate um, to the subject without having to dive in and be really afraid of what death would be like for each of us. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie, did you have a question? I've, I've got one. Um, I'm familiar with the uh, term doula, but I'm not familiar with a death doula. Is that, can you explain that a little bit more? I mean, I, I can assume what it means, but I'm just not familiar with the term, I guess, within that industry or, so can you talk a little bit about that and maybe how that plays into this as well? Yes. Um, so death doula, um, is like a birth doula. So with a birth doula, you, assist with um, somebody coming into this this world and um, that's do like you do the opposite somebody who's about to exit this world and it's an emerging industry it's it's pretty new um, but the training involves um, a lot of really overcoming our own discomfort with um, death and the fears around it so that um, 
when somebody needs us to be there um, because they are dying, we can show up and um, be comfortable while they they are suffering. We can we can be there and be comfortable so that they can be comfortable um, with their own feelings. Um, that's the best way I explain. Real um, technical guidelines as to what a death doula um, is supposed to do, but um, it's really being present because somebody who knows they are about to die, it's a very scary experience for them, and um, you're there to to hold their hands. Um, so that it's less scary for them and to know that they have support from somebody um, who can understand. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. All righty. Um, are we ready to go with uh, Wade? You've been very patient, Wade. Hey, I'm just uh, in my zen right here. All right. We good? All set. All right. Well, uh, let's see. So I'm Wade Larson, and I would, uh, I'm would i what you call a, a recovery and HR executive here in Spokane, uh, who's uh, on a mission to uh, put humanity back into the workforce. Uh, I've taken what you'd call an off-road journey through my 25-year career, going back and forth from what I call a real job to consulting and back again. Done that for about three cycles. And this has given me perspective. You know, working with hundreds of employers and, and thousands of employees, and so that's given me perspective. And what that's shown me is that people are basically the same. We all have the same problems, but we all think that they're pretty unique to each of us. And so now at this point, I'm on this personal mission with my wife of 29 years to fight mediocrity and improve the human condition. Uh, so you know, taking a look at, at this, this topic, it began initially to take a look at behavior in the workplace. And specifically, you know, I was looking initially at our failed attempts through the years to prevent harassment, discrimination, and bullying in the workplace, as it still goes on. And, and I think it, it was upon reflection of a harassment investigation that I had with a client. And I was sitting across from yet another supervisor who I honestly believe didn't think that what he was doing was you know, qualified as harassment. And, and he attended the trainings, he read the handbooks, but in a moment of stupidity, he sent a text message. And the victim in this case was offended, but you know, had held on to this incriminating evidence until the time was just right, uh, two and a half years later. And so this, this, you know, these cases of bad behavior, they happen all the time, and, and I don't excuse them. Some of them are intentional, but most of them really aren't. Uh, we deal with them appropriately, but here's the thing is that they haven't stopped. In 25 years, they keep going. And we've trained and we've educated. We've enforced them, we've mandated them through policy, and I don't think it's a matter of waking up one day and saying, you know, today I'm gonna to go to work and I'm gonna harass somebody. I don't think it's like that. But we keep on treating the symptoms of bad behavior. I'm not sure that we've really dealt with the problem. You know, the, the claims and the litigation, it's not going away. People are still behaving badly. We just modify the way that we misbehave to keep up with the times. So that was the start, but as I took a step back and I start to say, you know, uh, let's look at our at other areas of our life and, and, uh, and we look at, at our relationships and we recognize, you know, um, the closer we are to people, sometimes the, the worse we treat them. We're more willing to spend time on Facebook than we are uh, with those who are right next to us. We're short fused and rude with those who, are, who we're with all the time. And we worry, but we worry more about those, um, to whether we have likes on Facebook and, and those who are following us. When we look through the world around us, the politics are nasty and, and that's on both sides of the aisle. And in just a quick flash of a tweet, the, the dynamics can change immediately. And Hollywood and the press can, uh, you know, the most bitter things hit the, hit the airwaves. And now we have COVID. And that wasn't even on the radar when, when I first uh, submitted this. But now as we take a look at how people are interacting with one another, uh, you know, there's, there's social distancing. But I wonder if we use that to just avoid the virus or if we use that to push each other away. We're, we avoid eye contact with one another. And, and with these looks and comments and avoidance, you know, I've got to ask the question, are we ever going to be nice again? So that gets me to my big idea, which is this. It's a time for civility. That's the real issue, it's not, it's not about the symptoms, it's really about the civility. 
So getting back to square one, I think we're all exhausted. We're exhausted from the fight that we keep fighting with one another. It's truly a time to stop fighting. It's time to reconnect. And it's a time, it's a time to really be civil with one another. That's the real problem that we're, that we're taking a look at. So, you know, where my passion comes in on this is that civility still matters. And I think that sometimes we forget about that. Civility is the common language where we communicate and, and we respect one another. And this is where we lose the respect and we lose that ability to connect is when we lose that, that sense of humanity is, is with the incivility. So if we're going to uh, escape our limitations as society, we've got to find ways to connect and grow with one another. And we can't do that without this connection. We've got to find a way to get past ourselves and start to care again. And we, if we want to see the change that the world desperately needs, uh, that's, that's so desperately needed, we've got to find ways to connect. And personally, I've seen the best in people in my roles. And if we want to do more and be more, then we've got to start with this basic respect. So where I see, you know, where, where others should care about this really comes in you know, into the day to day. We see stress on the rise and in our basic lives, stress goes up, but in the workplace, stress is on the rise. And I think that a lot of this comes from how we treat with one another. Uh, this treatment comes from a number of sources, but adding a dose of civility uh, to our lives can, can help us, not just as the recipients of civility, but also as the givers of civility. We've tried to make this world so politically correct at times that we've forgotten how to reach out and truly care. Being right over being, you know, truly working together towards the same goals. We focus on whether someone used the right words over instead of whether or not it was the right meaning. It's time to focus on being nice over being right. So for thousands of years, society has focused on developing civility to help it mature and improve the human condition. And for us to continue to make progress, which we need to, I think we've forgotten that. We need to get back to the basics of respect so that we can move forward again. So the impact of this uh, is you know, if we can remember that we're all part of the same human family, we're all sharing the same planet and you know we're working towards the same thing. We all have struggles, we all have the challenges. If we can be working together, if we can be forgiving and start with the, down the path of civility, Maybe we can all go back to the basics of human nature, of connection, respect, and civility. And through this civility, we can improve the human condition. Those are the basics of the premise of, of, of where I want to go with it. So with that, it's back to you. Thank you very much, Wade. Appreciate it. Yep. Hey, uh, questions out there for Wade? There's a question on the chat. Let's see. Um, can you ask if he is going to suggest strategies that can make people more civil? Yes, I have. Uh, so I've got a book that's coming out this summer that's just, it's called A Time for Civility. And so I'm going, I'm using, a, I've got three steps or the, the three recommendations, narrowed it down from the, from the five of the books so we can fit it into the, into the minute timelines. But uh, uh, we're going to go to three, you know, three strategies. So we won't share them here for the timeline, but uh, I do have three, three strategies so that we can actually have steps and some how to's uh, to get through this. Uh, so it's not just a nice thing to talk about, but we can actually have some recommendations for how to implement it and get back to civility. Perfect. All right, do we have uh, any others? Okay, thank you, Wade. Tracy, are you there? I'm here, can you guys hear me okay? You have waited a long time, Tracy. You're very patient. Thank you. No, thank you guys. And thanks for everyone for staying on the line. I appreciate it. Ready when you guys are. You're all set. Okay. Very cool. All right. Well, my name is Tracy Simmons, and I am so lucky because I knew when I was 15 years old that I wanted to become a journalist. And it was in journalism school in New Mexico where I learned that one could actually become a religion reporter. I had two professors who noted my interest in theology and pointed me in that direction. And so that's what I've been doing ever since. Uh, in 2012, after working for newspapers all across the country, I landed here in Spokane to start a publication called Spokane Faith and Values, called Spokane Faves for short. Um, myself and a handful of journalists cover all of the religion news articles. And I have about 40 columnists who write for us, including Hindu and Muslim and a variety of Christian and Jewish and Buddhist and Quaker 
and the list goes on. When I'm not working on the FAVES project, I'm teaching journalism classes at Washington State University, or I will be come fall. So uh, people often ask me where my interest in religion reporting came from. And for years, I dodged that question. Only recently have I become comfortable acknowledging the fact that I actually grew up in a cult. So I was uncomfortable saying that because I didn't grow up on a compound. There was no polygamy. There was no Kool-Aid, <laughs> right? And that's what people often think that cults are. When in reality, cults are much more common and much more subtle than you might think. I spoke to a cult researcher not too long ago who said he learns of a new cult in the US every single day. I lived in an average neighborhood in Albuquerque. I went to a public school. I played on the city soccer team and I celebrated holidays with my extended family, my aunts and my uncles and my cousins. Uh, I grew up in the cult next door and nobody even knew. Instead of a church, we just gathered in our houses. We were led by pastors and prophets, and we all obeyed one man who claimed he was an apostle getting direct revelation from God. And it really didn't seem all that unusual at first. It was just fundamental Christians gathering together to pray and to study. But eventually, it evolved and it changed, and they swapped out the term Christians for believers. And instead of just studying the Bible, they began studying the apostles' teachings as a supplement. Now, my mom got involved with this particular group when I was in grade school. And she got involved because she was aching to belong. She had been abandoned by the man she loved, and she was left alone to raise a child. She was heartbroken, and she wanted acceptance. She wanted kinship. She wanted loyalty. And she wanted it so badly, she would do anything for it. She would believe anything for it. Cults are a lot like gangs. You'll do anything to fit in and to belong if you truly believe it'll fill that void that you're seeking. Now, the ironic part is that people often get involved with cults because they feel all alone. But when they finally get out, if they're lucky enough to get out, they're even more alone than they were before because they've written off everybody who loves them, often at the uh, direction of the cult leader. Cults preach isolation because anyone who questions their message is a threat. And that's what happened to my family. Not longer after I moved to Spokane, um, my mom mailed me two UPS boxes filled with my childhood things, my soccer trophies, my baseball cards, my stamp collection, which I'm embarrassed to admit that I had, and even my own baby photos. And it came with a letter. And that letter said that because I continue to disobey God's law, she could no longer be in relationship with me. I was disobeying God's law in the apostles' eyes, and thus my mom's eyes, because I was a religion reporter, because I was queer, and because, and this is the worst part, because I questioned their theology and I voiced that. So I lost my mom to a cult, but I found a career because of it. The dogmatic, hateful, greedy messages I was receiving as a kid never sat well with me. I'm grateful to have been born with this innate curiosity that led me to journalism. And journalism helped me escape from a very dangerous belief system. But I worry that my mom will never be free. She married within the group when I was in high school and has since climbed the ranks of the group and is now in the apostles inner circle. If all those years ago, someone saw my mom, if they truly saw her, I wonder how our lives would be different. My mom was only 22 when my dad left, and she went into survival mode, working day and night to put food on our plates. Everyone saw her determination, but nobody saw her pain. She tried to self-soothe um, by finding a community 
who would help her understand her circumstances and help her navigate this new life that she found herself in. And she didn't want to do it alone. She tried a mega church for a while, but it's easy to get lost there and to go unnoticed. Somewhere along the way, I'm not sure how, she ended up in the apostle's living room. The apostle was, he still is, charming and intellectual and handsome. He was this lawyer who welcomed her into his family. He didn't judge her for her past. All he did was offer her acceptance and later guidance. She saw in him the answer she was seeking. Of course she would do anything for him. Listen to anything that he told her. Now, I've started sharing this story because we all have hurting people living in our communities who are seeking belonging. And I have no doubt that we have cult leaders in our communities as well, ready to prey on the vulnerable. It wasn't just my curiosity that saved me from the apostles' living room. Those two professors I mentioned earlier, they saw me. They not only saw my inquisitiveness, but they saw that I had scars from my father's abandonment. And they saw that I was wrestling. I had this spiritual battle that I was dealing with all on my own. And they knew I needed a hand. I wouldn't be a religion reporter today. And I wouldn't have an understanding and an appreciation of the faith communities that make up this community if they hadn't given me the resources to continue my education and they hadn't pointed me on this career path. So I'm sharing this and I'm giving this talk because I'm trying to pay it forward in hopes that my actions can keep more families together today and out of the hands of spiritual abusers. So that's it. Thank you guys. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Tracy. Sure. Questions for Tracy. I have one, I think. Sure. Um, I think your story and your message is extremely powerful, but what, if you had to sum up your big idea in one sentence or a title, what would it be? Sure. Um, I was thinking about this earlier. I think, I think it would be that there are, I, I wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal a couple of months ago and it was called The Cult Next Door. And I think that's, that's it. Cults aren't, these aren't always these extreme things that we see, but they're in our own communities and we need to know the warning signs so that we can help our neighbors. Perfect, thanks. Do we have other questions? Yeah, I, uh, since you're doing the reporting here in Spokane and you mentioned that, th that you're sure there may be um, cults in Spokane, um, I'm, I would be interested in knowing more about that. I mean, how would you, how would you, uh, well, I guess, have you ever thought about doing a story on that type of research? Yeah, I've actually tried to do a, I started a book um, on it, kind of telling cult stories. Um, you know, that's, defining a cult is really tricky. I have some definitions uh, in mind. So, it's it's hard to find people willing to talk about it until they've come out of that situation, as you can imagine. Um, but there definitely are those spiritual uh, spiritually abusive communities in Spokane and in North Idaho. And, you know, I teach down in the Palouse and they're down here, too. So I think it's a story worth telling. It's just it's just a hard one to find people willing to go on the record. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Tracy? All right, that wraps up our evening. Um, for all of you who stuck it through, thank you very much. Give everybody who talked a hand, we really appreciate it. Um, as I said, uh, we will be making our decisions in the next couple of weeks, about uh, the next two weeks probably, about our lineup, and we'll let everybody know one way or the other when those decisions get uh, publicized. So, Charlie, anything else? The big event is 10-10-2020, and uh, you're all welcome to participate, even if, if uh, we can't find a place for you on one of the stages, whether they're virtual or not. Um, you're, uh, we appreciate your, you're putting it out there right now, and, and definitely look forward to having you 
continue to be a part of our, our TEDx Spokane family moving forward. So thanks again for your effort. Thanks. Jamie, anything to wrap it up? Ooh. No, this was, uh, this was a fun evening and uh, a lot of great ideas. And uh, we've got some tough choices ahead of us. All right. Well, thank you again for everybody who stuck it through. And uh, you'll be hearing from us one way or the other in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Good night, Thanks, everybody. everybody.